yourselves to each other as well. Uh, we'll get we'll kick it off with Claire Roberts. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. How are you? It's a, Good, actually yeah. afternoon here. Afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Can you introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. Claire Roberts. I am with Colliers International here in Minneapolis. I am an office specialist. I've been in commercial real estate for about 26 years. I started my career in Southeast Michigan and have been in Minnesota since 2014. Or excuse me, 2007, 14 years. Sorry. And you are in crew and you're an SIOR. I'll give Correct. you this as well. So thank Correct. you for joining us. You're welcome. How about you, Lance? Good morning. Morning. Um, so I'm Lance Duke. I'm with CRE Advisory Services. Uh, we're a boutique lease audit uh, company serving uh, clients across the uh, United States and Canada. Um, um, I'm a CPA uh, myself, and um, all I do is uh, lease audit. So different than the other panelists uh, on the session, uh, I'm not a broker, um, but um, I certainly love playing with the lease. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I've known Lance for a while now, and he is absolutely a master. So make sure that you find him. Jeff Tabor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Tabor. I have a company that I've had since 1993 called the Jeff Tabor Group. Now that I've rebranded, uh, prior to that, I was the top broker in Southern California for Grubb & Ellis. And prior to that, I was on the landlord side, leasing and managing uh, Class A buildings from downtown LA, Mid Wilshire, Denver, and Long Beach, California. I focus, I have offices now in Century City, downtown LA, Orange County, and San Diego, strictly 100% uh, tenant representation, office space. Jeff is a master, so make sure that you are following him as well. Um, I've never seen somebody cross off so much on a lease before and win so many clients, so make sure you're following him. Thanks, Steve Rands, what's going on, sir? How you doing, Natalie? Hey, doing everybody, good. great to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you give a little bio? Yeah. Not that you really need one. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, uh, Gabe Marins with uh, Savills in New York. Um, I'm, I'm a lifer. I interned at what was then Studley uh, back when I was at NYU. So I'm, I'm New York born and bred, as I like to say. Uh, and my friends uh, make fun of me that I spent most of my childhood in New Jersey, but we'll, we'll gloss over that point. Um, and uh, Savills, for those familiar with us, uh, we're tenor rep only, uh, similar to the way Jeff was describing. Um, and uh, it's fascinating to me because the topic here today about the lease is, is truly an opportunity for the good to separate uh, themselves in a bad way from the great. And all it takes is understanding uh, several really important provisions in a lease. Most brokers hand it over to the lawyer, but understanding uh, what, what matters is a way to uh, really showcase your expertise. And frankly, uh, most people think of a deal as just the economics of a deal uh, where you build true client loyalty is fighting for the things that are qualitative, not quantitative. Uh, so I have a feeling that's going to be a common theme here today, and I'm excited to learn from everybody. So thanks for having me and looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts. I'm so happy to have you guys. Oh, my gosh. I'm like geeking out. And then Kim Ford, who needs no introduction and is a crew sister as well. Kim Ford. Hi, everybody. I apologize for the hat. I'm actually sitting outside in Florida in a storm so that my teenagers can have the, the house and they're very loud. You should be happy that I put a hat on to tame the hair and the humidity. But um, I've been an office and industrial broker for what, 24 years. I've only been on the tenant rep side. I ran the Cressa office in Pittsburgh for 10 years and have my own firm called Rise Pittsburgh and uh, excited to be here with all of you and, and definitely agree with Gabe. Short and sweet. I like it. I, I noticed that I surround myself with a lot of tenant reps and talent. I mean, what, you know, how did I do that? So welcome everybody. Welcome in the room. I'm so thankful to have all of you. This is the new to CRE power panel. I've noticed there's a lack of mentorship and learning in this industry, uh, which is why I recommend things like crew, uh, which helped me. Um, and things like SIOR where you can take the classes and then this will be on YouTube. So share it and let's all make each other better. These panelists were selected. I've known them all for years. I look up to them myself. I've done deals with some of them and um, they are selected because they're good human beings. And if you reach out to them with a question, they'll genuinely help you. So they're not here because you know, they, they've got a good career history, which they do. They're here because I care about them and they're genuinely good people. Um, and there's a lot of not nice people in this industry and they were selected for that reason. So feel comfortable to reach out to them and ask questions. That's the whole point of this. Uh, so with that, the most important part of our process and you can earn business by being really good at it, which is why Jeff Tabor is here. That's how he differentiates, 
differentiates himself in Southern California and wins business, I've seen him do it, is saying, hey, is your broker doing this for you? And he takes apart the lease. And no, no one's doing that for that client in that, you know, in that building. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to look at an actual lease uh, for an actual client. And we're going to look at it through the lens of somebody that is trying to protect the client. Um, and, and also through the lens of why did the landlord put that in there? Um, and why would we why would we want to take that out? Or what does it mean? There's so many complexities. No one on this panel is an attorney. We're not trying to be. We're not going to speak to legal comments. That's not our lane. That's not what you want to do. So if you're new to being a broker, or you're thinking about it. Uh, the first thing that you want to say to your client is, these are my suggestions. And I highly advise that you get an attorney. Um, sometimes you don't even want to touch it and you always make sure that they have a real estate attorney. It's not their friend that does injury law. Um, you want them to have a real estate specific attorney. And I've blown up, seen so many deals blown up. I think we all have with uh, attorneys that do not specialize in real estate, completely butchering a lease and um, completely blown up the entire deal. Um, and even real estate attorneys blown up the deals. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to share my screen. If you have questions, raise your hand. Um, and Q&A, and we will do our best to answer them as we go. Don't be discouraged if we don't answer it in that moment. We'll come back to it. Okay, we ready, panelists? Mm -hmm. Who's ready? I'm excited. Do you do the happy dance when a new lease comes in, Natalie? <laughs> I do. You know why? Because <laughs> you're that much farther in getting that you're deal. That close. Yeah, the percentage exactly. goes up that that deal is actually going to close. Wouldn't you say what percentage would you guys put that on? Panelists, that the deal is going to close once you get that lease. Maybe go 99%. I'm 99. 99? Pretty close. Oh. Yeah, 90. It's my intent to close all deals. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's always the goal. All right, look at me with technology. Who's having fun? Nobody is surprised. If Kelly's on this call, she's like, yep, that's what's happening. Oh, Natalie, what are you doing now? Nobody knows. Okay, here we go. We're looking at it. And uh, I wonder how I, bear with me, everybody. And this is with practice. How do I get rid of us over on the right? Can I move you know this? what? I think it's Ooh, fine. It. It's That's fine. That's yeah, fine. You get that. You, you get it. Are we good? Yeah. Yep. yep. Leave it alone. I can't it's see good. the whole thing, though. Can you guys see the whole thing? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do that. Okay, cool. So let's start. This is a standard office lease. We're going to do office um, because that's what I am. So, but this, if you're in any specialty, this is going to, there's going to be things that apply. Um, and again, reach out to the panelists. If you're more interested in retail or industrial, they're going to help you. So we'll start with number one, lease of the premises. Um, it's just going through the size of the the um, suite itself and then the entire building that's pretty straightforward it calls out the exhibit you're going to want to make sure that the exhibit is accurate um, modification of the premises we're going through now the use what are oh, natalie, what are, natalie go back for a second to 1.1 i think some comments that i'd like to make on that is i, I think it'd be appropriate to identify how the space is measured number one we, we have a just we just call it in this particular lease just says square feet is it rentable is it usable what's what are we talking about here? What's the load factor? What kind of BOMA uh, standard was used uh, that should address that? And also, is there some kind of language if there's a dispute in the square footage measurement that the tenant has some kind of arbitration right to remeasure the space? It's kind of language I put in there. Yeah, so, and one of the things, yeah. Natalie, which could be helpful for 1.2 as well, and a lot of times the modification provision is further in the document, but something to keep in mind from a tenant perspective, a tenant broker perspective is your tenant, sometimes a modification could be misconstrued as a simple thing as like putting up artwork or nailing up a whiteboard, and then you could actually end up in default for your lease. So what we try to mm -hmm. recommend even to their council is that you add some type of provision and modification that says up to $2,000 or something like that, because if not, it makes them get approval and then they have to a lot of times pay a fee with a more um, substantial landlord. So you kind of want to be flexible with what modification really means because it could put you in default in many leases. Mm -hmm. Natalie, okay. if, if I could just add, I agree entirely with Jeff and um, Kim just said, but I think when you first start looking at this lease, don't assume that all the numbers are accurate. Right. Make sure you check them. Um, I've seen typos come through that everyone ignores. 
1590, 1509. I mean, it can happen very mm -hmm. easily. So make sure those numbers are correct and that the math is correct, especially mm -hmm. when you get down to the percentage. What is your percentage of the project? Make sure those numbers are accurate. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, everything becomes so second nature that I just did what I do, where you just, you completely gloss over stuff. Um, and I, I'm doing it with my own team where they're like, what did you just say? And I just did it on a webinar to teach people. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that's 1.1 and 1.2. Now 2.1 use, this is a big one and it's burned a lot of clients. What would you, what would you say? to 2.1, how could uh, somebody help their client on that one? For me, no, I'm speaking, so I'll go ahead. For me, I make sure it's not too limiting. I keep this more open and, and make sure it allows my client to have room, even if they're not doing it now. So say it's a, um, I do a lot of work for a um, nonprofit and in a headquarters location, we typically don't have a clinic but I make sure we allow room to have that language because at some point in time, they may move one of the clinic spaces within the headquarters. So just make sure it's not too limiting for future use. Yeah, and keep in mind too, from a, from a use type, if you ever have to sublease, and quite frankly, with COVID, we've all had people reach out to us saying we need help subleasing. If that provision isn't general and, and, and it's more specific, the landlord has the right to reject that subtenant and it makes it just easier for them to say no. So you really wanna make sure that that's broad and not limiting. Yeah, so if your client is a dentist and the landlord puts in there only the use only for a dentist um, or a law firm and you don't change that for your client and they try to sublease it, or let's say they expand their services or they merge and they wanna do printing or they wanna do finger, you know, who knows? then the landlord has a right to yep. um, reject that use. So you really, really want to make sure that it's general office use, general retail or whatever the use is. And before we go forward, um, would you mind scrolling back to the summary section of the lease? Um, a couple of pages earlier. Yeah, so if you look here, um, and just for everyone's context, I'm going to only be chiming in on the um, clauses of the lease that relate to additional rent. That's my wheelhouse. Um, if you look at the, the terms here, you see it says base year uh, sort of near the bottom of the screen and it references 2020 being the base year um, so for those who don't know so in a lease typically uh, you'll find a base year clause and that means that um, the rental rate you're paying typically would incorporate um, all the operating costs um, for the base year in the rental rate and then going forward you pay the increases of actual costs over the amount of the base year costs in this lease it's not evident to those uh, in the audience just yet, but you'll see the base year is referenced here as 2020. Later on in the lease, you'll see that it references the base year as 2021. Having a contradiction like that is a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. It's gonna it's gonna create problems, and there's gonna be an argument down the road as to which was the real intent. No, Lance, I I saw that too. My first comment was that with a May 5th uh, date. Uh, and a July 1 start date for that matter, it should uh, ideally be a 2022 base year, but notwithstanding that, it would be okay to accept the 2021, but have some kind of language that notwithstanding a 2021 base year, there will still be no past years for 12 months following the date of commencement. Yeah, 100%. And then we get bogged yeah. in here because there's a lot to talk about with the base year happening during COVID as well. But just wanted to highlight uh, on the summary page, uh, not to have, you know, be very careful not to have uh, contradictory language in here that's uh, supposed to just be recapping what's in the lease document. Uh, I, I, I have an additional comment on the, if you scroll down to the parking uh, reference, uh, some landlords will put that language in that the tenant will have X number of parking spaces. Uh, the problem with that, particularly if there's a cost associated with it, that uh, landlords will oftentimes use that as a pro another profit center, meaning that if you don't need all those spaces, you're still forced to have to use them. And so when I put language in there where it says here, tenants should be entitled to the non-exclusive use of a total of five, we would, I would amend that to say up to a total of five. So in, in other words, if some, some months they may need four or they may need three, but the way this is currently uh, uh, edited, that uh, they're forced to have to pay for five, whether they need it or not. Okay. And great. Thank you for calling out this play page, Lance. I was in a hurry to scroll, and so we skipped right by it. This is a great page for everybody um, on the call where it summarizes the lease, not the entire thing up. Hmm. 
not the entire thing. My son is uh, using the blender, uh, which is just the perks of being a mom. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let the panelists speak. Again, I'll just go back to details. Again, when you look at that summary, just make sure the summary is consistent with what is in the lease. I have found mistakes in the summary because a lot of times people use form documents and they just cut and paste. So you have to make sure that everything is aligned properly and that the numbers match as do the terms. Yeah, check that math, go through the red pen and just check it off. Why not just check the math, make sure that the 155 truly is you know, that number um, as, you, as you go through. So thank another you. thing to, to keep in mind on the parking provision is, you know, a lot of times tenant rep brokers, especially early on in, in, the, in your career, like you, you're meeting with your client and you're thinking of today, right? Today they need five parking spaces, but if you just signed a three or five year lease, the question really needs to be, well, where are you going to be in three to five years? Is five parking spaces enough? And you really want to make sure because we have had situations where tenants have come to us and said, oh my gosh, we, we, we're, we're like 20 parking spaces short. And I say, how did that happen? And it's because their broker didn't care. The broker just wanted to get the deal done. And so what happens is that tenant now is so mad two to three years later, and it's your fault. I mean, they're going to blame you. So just be really, make sure that you are planning and, uh, and allowing for growth or change. Um, because this, you know, this specific lease is really tight with parking. Typically, it gives you a kind of a ratio up to mm -hmm. a certain amount. So um, just be really careful. I, I've got a, I've got a question, a philosophical question for the panel, actually, uh, because I've seen a variety of different approaches to it. Um, generally, a lease, well, a lease is a legal document. A uh, legal document uh, is reviewed by a pr legal professional, lawyer. Uh, usually a paralegal, although the reality is is that. Um, but uh, how do you how do you approach your review of the lease and working in concert with a lawyer uh, in an effort to turn a document around on behalf of a client? Uh, you know, to what degree? What are you looking for? Thoroughness? Just a high level thought, uh, because I think we're all spoiled in that we this is what we do. But not every broker out there reviews uh, the legal document against the term sheet, for instance. Hey, Gabe, in, in Pennsylvania in particular, we are actually not permitted. We have to disclose that we're not attorneys and we're not permitted to mark up, change, modify, or provide any type of legal language. So really all we're allowed to do is let's just say our letter of understanding or letter of intent states that it's $21 a foot. I'm allowed to look to make sure that $21 a foot carried over and that's it. Um, what I've done is I've, I've really wanted to learn. So over you know, 24 years, I've learned pretty much every clause because I think it's really valuable that I can have a conversation with the client. So for me, I get on a phone and I will not put it in writing because I'm not permitted to provide that in PA. So every state does have different laws. And I tell them, for instance, like, you know, um, a holdover penalty, it should be 150% in Pennsylvania, they put it at 200. And so I'll give them my feedback, but I do it verbally. And I, and I put in writing that they need to seek a commercial real estate attorney, and I'm happy to make recommendations. That's how I do it. And how I do it is I tell the client, look, uh, in the interest of saving you some money on legal fees, I'll do a thorough analysis of the lease. And depending on the size of the deal, upwards of 80 plus changes that I'd recommend, and then I could forward it to his attorney that uh, they can narrow down those, uh, the red lines. So at least it'll, it'll help uh, save time and, and money on both ends. And, and plus that adds more credibility to me and more value on my side, rather than just negotiating the economics, I'm providing a lot more value in terms of my input in terms of what's doable on lease changes. Jeff, I think that's a great idea because um, um, your experience and understanding of additional rents um, probably far exceeds the council that would be looking at the lease as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, real important to have um, to have that markup, particularly on, on areas of the lease where the lawyer may be the one that's allowed to comment, but may not have the right expertise. I can make a comment on uh, we're going through the lease now on Article 3.1. I've never actually seen a uh, a clause like this where it states that uh, the second sentence, under no circumstances shall tenant be responsible for any costs incurred on account of a landlord delay. Blah blah blah. I, I've never seen that. It's uh, I, I I don't know a landlord a landlord on our planet who would agree with that. Typically, there's no rights at all that the tenant has, including not have including uh, uh, being stuck in a current situation if they're moving 
and being subject, subject to holdover rate increase by their then existing landlord. So typically this doesn't give the tenant any rights. So I would change this if, if it was worded correctly to state that uh, the space isn't ready at the proposed commencement date, which ostensibly is the day after their, their other lease expires that the, the then future landlord has to cover the expenses, the holdover increase in tenants existing lease as well as some kind of uh, blanket termination right if the space isn't ready, say within 90 days of the proposed commencement. It just holds the landlord's feet more to the fire to, to get the space ready, which they're gonna wanna do anyway for a, rent, for a rent start. But what if there are delays? What if there's a strike? What if the landlord goes out of business while construction is going, going on? What the tenants out there swinging in the wind? So we gotta build in some language to protect the tenant. Okay, and now what's the difference between the commencement date and the occupancy date, Gabe? Well, uh, a lot of it depends also on the structure of the deal. So, uh, for instance, um, you know, in uh, in New York, oftentimes you'll have land. Some landlords will offer turnkeys. Other will will build to a cap. Still, others will provide a TI allowance for tenants to build themselves. Uh, part of that depends on the difference between occupancy uh, and possession. Um, so. It can be nuanced, but frequently they're viewed as the same thing as long as the tenant is responsible for X and certain delivery conditions are met from the landlord's perspective. Okay. So what if they have free rent? When does the rent start? And I'm asking from the mind of a new broker. So when does free rent start? So if they have the first three months abated, meaning free, when would the rent start? Would it start on the occupancy? Yes. When, does, when does it start? So let, let's say you have uh, let's say you have a five year deal that has three months of free rent and you've got a nice clean uh, lease commencement date of January 1st. Uh, at that point, uh, the tenant would and all the delivery conditions are met. At that point, the tenant would take possession uh, on January 1st, uh, but they would not start paying rent until April 1st. Uh, now, of course, uh, we're getting a little bit further than than these guide guide rails right now. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the tenant isn't paying anything uh, on signing the lease in order for it to be considered executed. They'll be responsible for frequently paying, cutting a couple of checks, uh, including first months and uh, and rent uh, and security deposit. Um, so even though they're not paying rent for the first three months, they have effectively uh, paid a few months of free rent, uh, a, a few months of rent. So again, going a little bit over my skis here, but we can get oh. lost in the details on these leases. Over your skis, you're so funny. Okay, okay. Anything else in terms of commencement um, or even acceptance? If we were to go to three point three, that you think is important for us to point out, um, panelists. And only I'll just say I see a lot of leases that have um, under term commencement date as well as rent commencement, which then spells it out very clearly that the lease may commence on January one but the rent doesn't commence till March one. And then typically in our market, we see those free months, those abated rent months outside of the term. So a 60 month lease then becomes a 63 month lease. Um, and, and that's typically for banking purposes Okay. for the lender. Lender requires that. Okay. Now construction, um, this is a very, this is a very short one. This is more of a mom and pop lease. I think we could all agree, not a very institutional um, landlord lease. Um, that's the small, that's the shortest language I've ever seen. Um, not much to uh, pick on there. So I'm sure that we'll, we'll get into it in exhibit C itself. Um, so we won't skip to that right now. Typically when a, an exhibit is called out, you want to immediately go to that page within your lease. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we'll go ahead and go through and we'll get there um, a little bit later. Now the option to renew is definitely something that you're going to negotiate in proposals. That would be a fun next webinar is how to negotiate a proposal. It's actually the funnest, the, you know, the best part, in my opinion, of being a broker. It's really where you, uh, you know, it, it comes out, the gloves come off, in my opinion. Um, so again, when you're doing the lease review, you're going to have that proposal printed and out, and you're going to be comparing your business terms, not the legal terms, of course, um, to make sure that everything you negotiated for your client has made it into the lease, because dollars to donuts, there's going to be things missed um, while you're going through. So the option to renew, what, is, what are we looking for here, panelists? I, my perspective, uh, provided tenant is not in default, I, I would have changed that to read provided tenant is not in default uh, beyond any monetary terms and conditions in any uh, um, 
uh, default period of time frame. Uh, number, in addition, the said option shall be exercised by giving the landlord notice in writing 90 days prior. I mean, that's a specific date. That's what if the tenant misses that date by one day, then they lose their option. So I would change that to read no less than 90 days prior written uh, notice. Uh, there's no terms and there's no terms and conditions that it would apply to. In other words, if they exercise the way this reads, that the only thing that changes is their rent. Well, you know, you want the base year changed as well, and there has to be some definition of fair market value. There's no definition here of fair market value. And lastly, there should be some language that gives the tenant baseball arbitration rights if both parties are unable to agree on a definition of fair market value. That this should really be expanded. I mean, it's a small deal, but still, it should be expanded to protect the tenant. Okay. So you yeah. would insert what fair market means and you would insert no less than 90 days prior to that, correct? Correct, plus, plus baseball arbitration rights if both parties are un unable to agree on a definition of fair market value. Okay. Yeah, not every state does that, but I know that's definitely a California thing. So we've seen it mm -hmm. in a bunch of leases. Yeah, and I think I think it's important for uh, for people just to think about there being different moves within a lease. Think about it like any transaction. Uh, it's like a chessboard. So you've got offensive moves and you have defensive moves. For the most part, uh, flexibility, expansion, renewal, termination options, that's all defensive positioning here. Uh, if there's going to be an opportunity to grow, if you have a need to grow in a building, the landlord's going to do everything they can to ensure that you can grow. Uh, but you need to be able to protect your own footprint, which is the primary role of a renewal option. Very, very rarely do I see uh, renewal options be executed uh, pursuant exactly to uh, to the lease. Uh, in fact, even if you were to execute it, you'd be left without another renewal option unless you have subsequent renewal options. So you're even further exposed. So all of your comments uh, and Jeff's comments were along these lines are defensive. It's about protecting your position uh, and making sure that you have as much leverage in a negotiation, including defining all the FMV and how you arrive at FMV. Gabe, uh, that's 100% correct. And uh, um, you know, an option to renew is never in the landlord's interest to give. It's always in the tenants. In 35 years, I think I've seen an ex uh, option to renew exercise twice. And you're right, it just preserves the tenants tenancy and it forces the landlord, whether they like it or not, to have to negotiate in good faith with the tenant. And, and, that, and at the end of the day, they may not want to because there might be a bigger tenant who wants the space. But now that the tenant has an option to renew, the landlord is forced to have to honor this, this tenancy on the, on the terms of the option. Jeff, I totally agree with you. And I had this happen with a client of mine. And I think too often brokers, especially younger brokers, don't think the option to renew is a big deal and they don't fight for it enough for their clients. But I had a client that had about 20% of a building and um, the tenant that had 60% wanted to take the rest of the building. Mm -hmm. And because my client had the option to renew, they, the landlord had to deal with us. And mm -hmm. we ended up getting a very nice size check to move out of the building and to relocate. And so it's, it's very important to protect, as you said, your client's interests. I will also tell you with that 90 days, um, I had another client, I kept saying, your lease says you have to give notice by, and I kept telling my client, kept reminding them. And um, it was a very major uh, national landlord that at 501, they got a letter that uh, their lease was not going to be renewed and terminated, would be terminated you know, at expiration because there was another tenant that wanted their space and that tenant was larger. So these clauses are very important. And I think, you know, especially again, as a newer broker, you can't gloss over them, but you have to give them a lot of credence and credibility because they are very important to your clients. That is such a great point and a great story, Claire, and so important for the newer brokers and even us that have been doing it for a while to remember, you know, how important and it doesn't matter the size of the client, they deserve proper representation. Um, so that's a really great point for everybody. And just to refresh the room, uh, welcome to the new to CRE power panel, whether you're new, I see some OGs in the room. Uh, I, you know, I was, I scrolled through to see the participants and uh, welcome to everybody and a lot of people from the CRE fam are here. And thank you for joining us. And I hope that you share with the YouTube link once it's up, because I mean, this is just such a great, great experience. I feel so blessed to have all of you. I'm, I, I'm so thankful to be, you know, getting to do this with all of you. So thank you. And um, Natalie, Natalie you see a lot of people in the, in the chat, there's some chat comments, that are like 16, I see, I don't know if you want to address that, or they should be switched over to q and I don't know if people are bringing up questions that we can't see or what. Yeah, I, because I'm screen sharing. Um, 
I'll, I'll have to, I'll ask somebody to go ahead and text me if there's any questions, but if you are asking questions in the chat, everybody, I do need you to use Q and A and I will click that and see that it was asked if it's being recorded and it will be available yesterday. I'm um, yesterday. Wow. I'm um, in the future. Yes. It, <laughs> and you'll see that link go out um, on LinkedIn and various channels. It will be available for you to watch and share um, with, you know, with your office and juniors and things of that nature. Um, but other than that, I will not be moderating the chat. Um, so you do need to ask. Um, okay, so initial basic rent. This is a big one, right, guys? Oh, what do we see sure. going on here? What are we looking for? Got to make sure it's accurate. That's all. Okay. Anything else? We're just we're just checking to make sure the numbers match. Mm -hmm. I don't see any um, light payment, but that might be its own clause. That might be its own clause. Okay, we're moving on through cost of living increases. That's interesting in an office lease. Yeah, typically they don't call it cost of living increases. Typically right. they just refer to it as additional rent or ever they just put it as a rent table, um, especially the more sophisticated landlords. Oh, that's an old school term. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very old school and I would never agree to it. If you go back, you can pull up a history of cost of living. Those numbers vary so greatly. It's insane. I mean, from 0% to like 16%. Yeah. Well, there's Do no, not, there's no uh, annual increases. That's, I mean, that's what it is. It's annual Yeah, increases. well, there's no correlation between the cost of living and the price of commercial real estate anyway. So it's- It's, yeah, just, it's, it's the uh, wrong, yeah. I mean, the title should change to begin with. Right. But it looks like- annual increases. Okay. Yeah. And then partial months, that's pretty much it. Uh, no offset. That's important. Okay, let's review it. This, this is a this is yet another thing when we're playing offense versus playing defense you got to play defense you got to have the right to uh to to cure uh uh mistaken moves on everybody's part the landlord has certain rights to cure you have certain rights to cure uh this is one of those things so this is about optionality again i very rarely see an offset actually take place but the knowledge that it's there perhaps ensures that it doesn't happen. I love that. Playing offense, not defense, just kind of see any loophole that they can take, right? Okay, now the security deposit. What is your recommendation when it comes to the security deposit? What would you put in your proposal? Let's start there. When you're, you know, if you're sending out an RFP or even a proposal for your client, what are you saying? What are you offering? Um, are you saying no security deposit? Are you what are you what are you saying there on the the, get the majority of our clients, Natalie? They wouldn't be paying a security deposit, but we deal more in the the class A um, spectrum. Now we do have some kind of mom and pop or startups that will be referred to us that we work with, and we're we really don't address it in the RFP. We let the landlord come back to us at that point and request financials. And at that point, one recommendation I would have, and and you guys may agree or disagree based on your states as well, but don't ever be involved in evaluating your client's financials. It opens up a huge potential for litigation on you. Um, one of the things I always do when a landlord requests it is I say, great, who should they be mailed to? Please don't include me on that email and send them directly. Um, and then you hear back what the circumstances are. But for those smaller tenants, it's we, we just wait and see what happens, Natalie, because you know us just going right out and saying we don't expect a security deposit um, we just don't even address it. And 99% of the time, we're not paying one anyway. And one month at max. So basically, everybody in the audience, Kim just let us know that she only works with big fortune 100 and 500 clients. That's what's happened there. And I'm allowed to make fun of her. So. Hey, hey Kim, you, you, you've got to call me next time you're in New York because I just had a landlord ask for 24 months, that's two years uh, of security deposit on a deal. Wow, oh, that's great. At, that's at, at, New, at New York rent. So they're, they're not getting the deal. But I want you in New York so you could help me negotiate that. Because yes, whatever you're doing yeah, is magic. It's... <laughs> so what Gabe is saying that is, is that a landlord asked for additional securitization. That will sometimes come up. If your client had a rough time during COVID yeah. or doesn't have the financials, the landlord sometimes will say, okay, we're going to need additional securitization because they want to know that they are going to be safe should your client go under or whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. And so you sometimes have to guide your, we're not brokers, we're advisors. And so you need to advise your client through that situation if it makes sense. Now, 
Gabe, of course, is not going to advise his client for that situation. He's going to go, that landlord is ridiculous. Well, uh, keep in mind, there's there's flexibility. So we have been in a situation like Gabe, never at that extreme, but let's just say they wanted six months because the landlord's putting in $5 million to upgrade the space to the tenant's specific needs. What we always recommend to that client is we negotiate a burn down clause. And what, really what that means is let's just say it's a million dollar security that they need because they're spending a significant amount of money on the client. They put that money in an account and that burns off for the first four years. So by year four, all they have left is maybe first and last month's rent. And so what that makes everybody comfortable because at that point, the risk is a lot less. The tenant's there, right? Paying their rent. There's no monetary. That's the word Jeff used. It's really important. You recognize the word monetary default, not just default. Monetary means there's something you did wrong with money. Um, mm -hmm. It's a game changer. And that burn down clause can be really, really significant. Um, anytime there is a security deposit we've had to deal with, we negotiate a burn down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael, Michael Arnold in the comments in the chat uh, raised a good point, uh, which is you got to understand client financials. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that you have to understand how to walk through um, a cash flows, a balance sheet at, at, at a minimum just to understand how to advocate for your client, which in part means presenting the best face to the landlord. So knowing how to speak that language is really important. You don't have to be an accountant, you don't have to be a land stoop, but you can, you can at least uh, do the bare minimum. Yeah, and if you have to tell your client's story, then you know they might not have the best financials. Um, so I think, you know, if you're, if they're not a publicly traded company, then you're probably having different conversations. Um, so I do agree with Kim from the standpoint of, Hey, get the, get the asset, get the landlords direct information and have your client do that, the CFO and them directly communicate. You don't want to be playing monkey mm -hmm. in the middle anyway, but if you are in a position where it's like, I do agree with Michael Arnold, who, by the way, everybody needs to be um, following on all avenues um, with NAI in Southern California. He heads their tenant um, rep division. Um, I'm calling it the wrong acronym, the wrong name, but make sure you're following him. Um, he, I do understand what he's saying. Um, you want to make sure that you're able to properly explain what's going on and then how to best structure the securitization. And there's different ways to do that, um, you know, with whether you're using, you know, special financing or whatever's going on. So great point, Michael Arnold. And then to answer the question, in the Q&A, um, no. Uh, can an office lease only go up to three years before renewal um, was the question that we got panelist. How do you, how do you answer that, Claire? Well, uh, an office lease, are, the basic term can be any length of time. It could be one year, it could be 10 years. And so a renewal then can be structured for any negotiated period of time as well. So it's all a matter of negotiation. So yeah. and it just like depends on what the initial term is and then you go from there. And it typically matches. So what Claire is saying, so if you're doing a five-year lease, you're typically going to ask for a five-year renewal option. Um, and you typically want to ask for more than one option. Well, and keep in mind, tenants typically benefit from options. Landlords typically do not benefit from options like Gabe was saying. Right. So one of the things you have to keep in mind is renewal options. We always negotiate multiple renewal options. And what they look like is one can be short-term, one can be long-term. The short-term doesn't have any type of um, updating um, you know, like carpet and paint allowance, but the long-term does. So we try to give tenants two or three options that we negotiate actually in the RFP. So they're seeing that from the very beginning. Okay. But, but Kim, I will say, I think that Gabe said it earlier and maybe I'm wrong, maybe it was Jeff, but basically you, you negotiate the options to renew and when it actually comes time to negotiate that renewal, what's written in the lease, a lot of times isn't even used. It's the fact that that option is there. That it's there. That's the we, tenant that's has exactly that right. That's correct. The and the and then you go yeah. from there. Yep. The fact of the matter it's is, you, you sit down with you sit down with the landlord and say, "Hey, Grant, we got an option to renew. Let's put it aside for the time being. Let's talk Turkey. We're looking at other buildings. What's the best deal we can get?" Yep. That's right. There you that's go. Right. Yep. One hundred percent. Just a fallback. That's all it's for. Yeah. Yep. And you go back out to the market and you see what's going on and then you right. negotiate. Yeah. But you want your you want your tenant, your client, to have that right because if they don't, they can be out the door with no rights at all and getting into all the expense of starting all over. Okay, we got rent adjustments. This is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> so there's, um, I'd like to walk through um, looking at the time we have left. I mean, really, 
to, to properly give the additional rent that the attention it deserves. Um, we could spend on this, um, but what I'd like to do is talk through just a very, just for a couple of minutes, um, some highlights of, of issues that I have with 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 uh, listings. Um, so 5.1 is just speaking to the fact that uh, we touched on earlier that the, ba the operating costs are built into the base rent. And so all the tenant is responsible for paying is the increase in operating costs over those of the base year. So this is saying that um, in the year, essentially after the base year, it's poorly rewarded, and we're not going to get into rewording this whole thing. But it really, what it should be saying is the year after the base year, the landlord will estimate how much the increase over the base year operating costs will be, and the tenant's going to add one twelfth of that to each month's uh, uh, rental payment to the landlord. This uh, last sentence here um, is basically uh, giving the tenant a protection, a cap protection, uh, which is nice to see, but a cap protection of 15% is ludicrous. <laughs> it's, you may as well not have even had the price right. right. there. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. Maximum 5%. Um, the fact that it's non-cumulative and, non and, and non-compounding is good um, because it just says uh, over the uh, actual expenses. But 15% is too high. It should be five or less. Um, hey, Lance, wouldn't you agree that if the landlord is to uh, agree to a cap, which is always good, that it, it's fair that they cap only their controllable expenses? In other words, everything ex uh, not accepting uh, unionized labor, taxes, insurance, and utilities? It, it should only cap controllable expenses. That's right. The landlord. To be tenant, though, um, the, the non controllable expenses should be clearly defined and not right. be a list that include uh, include a number of items uh, and, uh, and examples uh, are such. The non-control items need to be specified. And typically, they're insurance, utilities, uh, realty taxes if they're included in OPEX. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you'll see janitorial, um, snow rule if you're in a, in a very heavy snow belt. Um, but typically, it's utilities, insurance, and taxes are not uh, included as uh, controllable items. Um, and um, you can get into a lot of trouble fighting with the landlord afterwards, what is non-controllable? And I've seen landlords fight back on, uh, well, we did an extraordinary repair, so it's uh, not a controllable expense. Well, that's, that's not how it goes. Um, let's move on to 5.2. So 5.2 is attempting to define um, what is uh, included in operating expenses. Um, this is a, um, and for such a small lease uh, uh, of 1,500 or so square feet, there's actually some pretty good exclusions here. Um, the, um, um, the, the, I'd like to focus more on um, not what's um, in here, but what's not here. And what's not here is HVAC. So um, there's an HVAC section that comes later in the lease that basically says that if uh, the, the landlord gives a warranty on the HVAC equipment for the first year of the lease, this is a three-year term, essentially. So for the first year, the landlord will warranty the, the HVAC. For the second and third year, if the system needs to be replaced, uh, the tenant will pay for the replacement. And at the expiry of the lease, the landlord will pay back the tenant the unamortized portion of what they spent on that HVAC unit. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because let's just say for argument's sake, the tenant is not intending to stay past the three year mark. Why would it, why should it be expected to fork out the dollars to pay for a new HVAC unit, um, which could be 10,000, 20,000, who knows how much it's gonna be. Um, um, when uh, it's really the landlord who should be putting the bill for that and then recovering it back from the tenant. It's a lot of money to put on a small tenant to pay for if, you know, on such a small, um, uh, such a short term. Um, the, uh, if we scroll down a little bit more, and I'm not going into too much detail because of the time here. This is a pretty simple property and there, there are some good exclusions here, but I wanted to focus on the HVAC because it was major. Um, also, what's interesting, actually, back, just back to the operating cost section, there's no mention of a management fee, and that's uh, that was really unusual. Um, the first line item, if you scroll a little bit down more, the first line in no, uh, the other way, uh, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Stop. So the right under operating expenses 5.2, the second line you'll see the costs incurred in connection with the management, uh, operation, maintenance, and repair. So. This, in my view, is not strong enough for the landlord to recover a management fee. Um, the legal community typically feel that um, 
you know, there's a number of cases out there that if, if, it, if the lease doesn't specify that a fee is recoverable, the landlord can't charge a fee. This reference to management uh, is referencing the cost of the people and the, the recoverable, uh, the, the allowed items that are management related that the landlord can recover its actual costs of, but not a fee based on a percentage of, of either operating costs or gross rents. Um, there's no mention of a management fee in this lease. I thought that was rather unusual. Um, let's scroll down to 5.3. I'm trying to stay high level just in, in respect to the time. This is a really um, uh, poorly worded lease. It's going through a lot of detail here in 5.3a on how you determine the operating expenses for the base year. Um, and that's as you know, 90 days after the expiry of the, the, the base year, uh, which again, this is contradicting the summary where you saw 2020 reference uh, as being referenced to be the base year. Uh, the landlord 90 days afterwards will give the tenant a, a, a schedule showing what the base year expenses were. Uh, and that'll form um, uh, the basis uh, for um, any, any increases thereof for the remainder of the lease. But the op this, this lease doesn't actually go into any detail in terms of how operating costs are going to be reconciled in the second year of the lease or the third year of the lease. Um, it doesn't say how long the landlord has to provide the reconciliation. If the tenant has any audit rights, there's no audit rights provided here. So that suggests the tenant does not have a right to audit and uh, shouldn't expect one. Um, because it's not worded. Uh, so it really needs to have some, some a, a lot more meat here. This, this lease is missing uh, some, some important language. Um, hey Natalie, if I, if I could chime in for a quick second, if uh, the people on this on this chat aren't, if, if they could increase their, their knowledge on how to protect a tenant by 20% on operating expenses, they're gonna win a ton more business against their competitors who aren't doing that. Um, this article, like like Lance said, I mean, there's no audit rights. You need audit rights as a as a, as a tenant rep to, for your client. Uh, there's no statute of limitations language in here. In other words, the tenant, the landlord has plenty of time to decide, even later years of the lease, to pass their expenses from prior years. You got to put some kind of, uh, and I put language in there that says if the landlord has, fails to make a pass through within, for example, 18 months of the date of the cost, unless it's a prop, unless it's a tax related issue, they waive the right to charge the tenant. And I say that from experience because uh, several years ago, I cold called a tenant who she said, hey, you're too late. I just hired Liam Associates to help with my lease. And I said, well, where are you on that lease? You know, I know a Chinese company just bought the building. And they said, well, we've, we're eight years into a 10-year lease. And in fact, we just got a $70,000 bill from the landlord who did a forensic accounting of the prior eight years and uh, said, we owe this amount of money. And I said, well, you do have statute of limitations language in there. She had no idea what that was. And I said, well, let me come in and take a look at the lease. She goes, well, why waste your time? I already got a deal, a deal with a uh, Lean Associates. I said, well, give, give me that opportunity anyway. So I spent about an hour and a half with her. She ended up firing Lean Associates and, and went with me. She breached her exclusive with them. And we got this language in the lease. I mean, you need some language in here regarding parking. Most leases and operating expenses allow the landlord to charge costs associated with the use and maintenance of the parking facility. Well, what if the landlord is also charging for parking spaces. Aren't they double dipping then? So you really got to go in and change the lease where it says the landlord can only charge the net expenses associated with the, the use and maintenance of the facility after they've applied the revenue they'd otherwise receive from it. A lot of these leases will have language in there that allow the landlord to pass through and charge it as an operating cost rather than a capital cost, which you'd rather have because then it's amortized versus an operating cost, which the tenant get, your client gets hit right away. Costs that are associated with the to improve the operational efficiency of the building. By way of example, let's say the, air, the landlord wants to put a new air conditioning system in the building that costs a half a million dollars. Most leases, unless you change that, will allow that landlord to charge that as an operating expense. Because why? Well, because in the lease, it has language in there that if, if a cost item is meant to reduce future operating expenses, future, i.e. utility costs in this case, the landlord could define that cost as an expense rather than a capital cost. So we put language in there that says if the landlord wants to do that, and let's say, for example, your tenant has a year or so left on their lease, are they going to receive a benefit over the remaining lease term versus the cost that the landlord's going to charge them for the, for the item they're going to install, the air conditioning system? So put language in there that says that the landlord, unless they can demonstrate a net present value benefit over the remaining lease term for the tenant, the landlord can't pass that through as a cost. Another item I put in there in California, it's near and dear to our, my heart. I know Mike Arnold would agree with this, this too, earthquake insurance. Most landlords, or a lot of them don't have earthquake insurance because it's very expensive. But in their lease, it allows the landlord to charge as a, as a, as a pass-through. 
but that's a huge expense to the tenant. And I say this from example, I was representing a top criminal defense firm and on a renewal, uh, a fourth, fourth time client over 20 years I represented them and they just got a, a large bill for their, for their uh, insurance costs related to the property, related to in, in their operating expenses, their insurance uh, line item. And the reason being Prudential bought the building and Prudential said, well, we think the building's underinsured so we're going to now uh, carry earthquake insurance. Well, the tenant, instead of paying their pro rata share based on the increase in the base year, had to pay their pro rata share based on the full amount of the premium. So next time around, what I do in leases, I'll put language in there that states that if the landlord doesn't otherwise have earthquake insurance or a similar cost item that is a huge cost, that if they elect to carry it during the lease term or any extensions thereof, the base year gets grossed up to reflect that added cost that the tenant only pays their share of the increase and not their share of the full lump sum premium. So you're 100% right, Jeff, and, and building on the insurance uh, provisions, um, you know, most of my clients are leasing um, uh, hundreds of thousands or more square feet in AAA office buildings, and um, not so much in, the, in the, 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 um, the, the central or eastern part of the U.S., but certainly on the West Coast, terrorism and earthquake uh, uh, are, um, mm -hmm. are, are large premiums. Um, I have seen language in, in, lar in, in uh, good leases where even though earthquake coverage is allowed, um, it caps the uh, amount of coverage to half of the building value. So, I mean, really, the, the, what, what value does the earthquake provision provide to the tenant if the landlord buys earthquake insurance? If the building is knocked down, mm -hmm. the tenant is not going to sit around and wait for five to 10 years for the building to get demolished and rebuilt, mm -hmm. look for other space. So you're only protecting the landlord there. So you really need to look at giving the landlord earthquake coverage in your lease, no different than you're giving more base rent because you're not protecting any of your interest. You're not gonna enjoy the, the, the building. Whereas if they spent the same well, on CapEx, you might enjoy something, you know, a higher standard of living, uh, so to speak, of being in the building. Um, I wanna talk about auto clauses just very briefly. And we don't have a lot of time. The, the, the deal breaker in an auto clause is that it um, has to be done on a non-contingent basis because most tenants do not want to pay to find out if they've been overcharged. And if the landlord is acting appropriately, they shouldn't be concerned whether or not um, uh, the auditor is being paid on an hourly basis or on a contingent basis. The background behind that is that landlords typically feel that if it's an hourly basis, the auditor is not going to be as aggressive. The account for that is to put a, a restriction that says the, the audit needs to be done by a CPA. Uh, to be done by a CPA will remove a significant portion of the population who might be uh, more aggressive um, and, and fighting for that contingent piece a little more um, um, aggressively than a, a CPA who's a professional who's not going to put their reputation on the line um, and, um, and risk getting into trouble that way. Um, well, Lance, if I, if I could say one thing, and I think, Gabe, you've probably done this, and particularly in New York for longer term leases, I recently helped out a, a 25,000 square foot insurance firm in Southern California. And as we're going through the negotiations, we had a 10 year lease with a five year out. And I had an idea that I approached my client with. I said, how about if I negotiate, I have an idea. I said, how about if I negotiate a right, uh, if you will, at the expiration of the 60th month of the lease term, in other words, halfway through the lease, that at our option, we can have the base year recalibrated to the then current year. And he says, well, what, what would that do to me? And I, for me, I said, that'll do a lot of good things for you. It'll get rid of all your past expenses of prior years. And it'll set your new base year to the current, now current year, which ostensibly is a higher cost year than it was five years ago. And the landlord, Lincoln Properties, for two times said no to that. And the third time, they finally said yes. But at the end of the day, the landlord happened to sell the building at, uh, at year five. My, ten my tenant exercised their option to terminate and uh, save themselves close to a quarter of a million dollars in additional past years because the, they, uh, they got the new base year as uh, the year the building sold. So the, the Proposition 13 related taxes property taxes, uh, they were they were covered by. They didn't have to worry about paying them and saved them a ton of money. Again, it's not not a mandatory change in the base year because what if the expenses have gone down? You don't want that to happen. So it's just, if they've gone up, which they usually do, you have the option to resetting the base year. You know? You're not going to get that from most tenants, but if you've got a good sized tenant, 20, 25,000 square feet, who's doing a long-term lease, you, the people on this call ought to think seriously about uh, bringing something like this up to the table. I've already seen clients that have language in their leases protecting them from a base year that starts in 2020 or 2021 that's artificially low because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and 
and um, there's not enough time to talk about it, but just be aware that uh, for anyone doing a deal where you're resetting um, a base year or you're starting a, uh, with a cap that allows for increases um, uh, over 2020, this is on the landlord side, they'd be uh, at a negative disadvantage if they're capping out based on a 2020 artificially low year, uh, potentially. Um, but with the base year, the tenants may be at a disadvantage, not having that base year up sufficiently uh, to reflect what um, a fully occupied building would be. And there's a debate in the legal community what fully occupied means. And the leases don't define occupancy. Uh, do you gross up if there's no tenants there or if the tenants I mean, I mean, just don't show up but they have a lease or does it only count if there's no lease there that it's a vacancy in the building uh, subject to gross up. So there's a whole, we can have a whole you know day discussion on a number of different sophisticated issues in the lease. Um, but um, you know, there's not well, Lance, Lance, what would you recommend? Would you recommend going backwards to like an 18 or a 19 base or going forwards to a 22 or a 23 base to address that? It's going to be dependent on each building and, and when the CapEx programs took place. A lot of landlords have taken advantage of the low occupancy in 2020 and spent CapEx uh, renovating the building because you're disrupting your tenants. So um, I think you need to look at 20, uh, the one or two prior years at the but really, it should just be the most recent calendar year no, out to, or, or uh, you know, looking for that comes the base, but the base needs to be grossed up properly and there needs to be an audit mechanism where you're allowed to audit the base year or wait till the first year after the base year and then audit the base year plus the next year's worth of uh, operating costs together. Yeah, I, I would say one last, last thing on this. I mean, other than the rent section, which specifies the tenant's rent obligations uh, as that's an important section because it has to be correct in what was agreed upon. I think if there's anybody on this uh, on this chat today uh, who wants to know the most important thing of the lease, I think it has to do with operating expenses because that's that's usually what what ends up snake biting the tenant, uh, which may, at, may which may be if you're calling on this company as a prospect, the best way you can create value to show the distinction between what your knowledge of is to how to protect the tenant um, versus what his prior broker did or her prior broker did. So. I'd say 90% of my business actually comes from uh, meeting with a prospect or talking to them on the phone and, and ideally sitting down in their office in a conference room or a spare cube and evaluating their lease totally pro bono and uh, no, no, no uh, books, no, uh, no charts or anything like that, just what I got in my, in my head and then giving them a litany of recommendations, particularly as a place to operate expense protection. And so right, right away, right away, I distinguish myself between, you know, their broker, who I'm sure is a good guy or a good person, who didn't do this stuff. And uh, this really, if there's anything that can help you stand out in the crowd, from a, market, a branding point of view, it's knowing operating expenses and how to protect the tenant. Because most people have no clue about this stuff. Best clause that I've ever seen a client have, um, and one of my clients does this throughout their, most of their leases, the landlord is not allowed to issue a reconciliation past nine months if it expects to get paid. So the provision says basically something like the landlord shall issue the year end within whatever 120 days. However, if failing, if the landlord does not provide the reconciliation within nine months after the end of the previous calendar year ended, the tenant is not obligated to pay any amounts owing, but is entitled to any credit. That's a powerful language to restrict uh, a landlord's ability to go backwards and uh, think about redoing their operating costs and it also provides certainty for the tenant. Exactly. Lance, that's our clause for, that's our recommendation for every lease that we do. And, and Jeff, just to, to, you know, ditto what you said, we had a client we were working with at the very end, they had a lease expiring. They gave us six months to help them get into a new building, which is not a lot of time in our market um, to do any type of construction at all. And um, they got a bill from their landlord right when they right when they went to leave for ten years of operating expense adjustments. There was no clause in their but their they had a broker do their last deal, did not care, just got the deal done. I'm not. It was half a million dollars, and they had they went to their attorneys and I read the clause and I'm like I'm not an attorney, but I'm going to tell you right now it's a why you are wide open. I mean, if your attorney can get you out of this, good for them, but your broker did you an injustice by allowing you to go 10 years. They never sent a bill until they went to leave. Yeah, I think about You it. know, it's interesting and about all of these fail. stories and all these stories, like they're all examples of like the non-core lease issues, the non-core economics that really you'll get that angry phone call from, from a client. And if you were involved in the deal, then 
bad on you. But if you were not involved in the deal, it's an opportunity to shine. Right. You know, we haven't really talked about it, but with security deposits, someone mentioned burn downs. There's nothing that gets me happier than walking in, developing a relationship with a new client, them sharing their lease with me and me asking them, hey, guys, did the landlord ever give you that 100 grand that they owed you two years ago? Draw on the floor. You have to do a lot of bad to like, like equal that out. So you, you, you have some runway there. Yep. So true. We it, scheduled, you know, one, one, one quick second. We scheduled an hour. I knew it was going to go over. I am so thankful for everybody's time. I'm going to a lot, 30 more minutes. So we're going to stay till 1130 Pacific time. Um, anybody that can stay on with us on the panel, I, I would love you to, if you can, I so respect you and thank you. And um, I understand because we're it's so busy right now. So um, with that, I do add, I would love you to stay. Um, and we will be doing an entire another uh, series, or I should say, episode completely on operating expenses, base year, auditing, everything. Um, I'm going to invite everybody that's here um, to join us again. Lance will absolutely be on that. He and I have already kind of discussed that because look how long we just spent on one area. And if your eyes are crossed and you're feeling completely overwhelmed, yes, that's me. Um, you're not alone. It is an area that is not properly discussed. And that's why courses like CCIM and other things are there and so important. So do not feel um, overwhelmed. That's why this is going to be recorded. Go listen to it again. The best thing you can do is continue to listen to things over and over and again um, from these complete pros. I mean, that's why Jeff is separate in, you know, in what he does. I've seen what he does and um, he's truly just, a, I, it's like a beautiful mind with all the, the stickies on the wall. That's, that's the way his brain works. So do not feel intimidated. That's why we're here. That's why we want you to be better. Um, he's not hiding his paper. He's sharing his paper and that's why he's here. So I, I know how you're feeling in the audience. I get it. Um, I'm there with you and I've been there and we're all trying to be better. That's what this is all about. So don't, I don't want you to feel discouraged. Um, and Natalie, one last thing I'd like to add on the operating expenses. I think not done. Yeah. For, for all of us, this, this is the greatest opportunity to shine. At least it is for me, because if there's any piece of information or document that the tenant during their lease term gets from the landlord, that is the most opaque, non-transparent and hardest to understand is their operating expense bill. So yeah. when, they get, when they get that bill, usually reconciliation is the first quarter of every year. And they usually get a bill because they underbilled for the prior year. And they get two bills, actually, because they get a new bill for the ensuing year because they always seem to go up. So if you're reaching out to prospects and your clients, you know, first, you know, February, March, April, every year, particularly to say, hey, you know, you're soon to get this bill if you haven't already got it. And it's probably very hard to understand. And I'll be happy to come in and take a look at that bill to make sure that it's in compliance with the lease and also give you some really good thoughts on how to protect you next time so you're not snake bit if you were. And I'll tell you what, I mean, and I, and I say that notwithstanding whether they have a broker relationship or not. Yeah. And people, well, people will often say, hey, I... You know, I have a broker. I said, when's the last time your broker reached out to do that for you? And exactly. before they even answer, I say, never, right? I'm, they're good guys and, and folks, but they just don't do this stuff. So if you can have, if you spend an hour a week as, as a younger person in this business, just trying to understand this or getting the lingo down so you act like you know it when you're talking to a prospect, you're going to get a ton more business, a ton more business. Yeah. Or is it an opportunity to hire somebody like your firm, Lance? Is that, isn't that your lane? And you work throughout the United States, you work throughout Canada. I mean, that's where you can suggest, depending on the type of company that you're working with and representing to hire your firm, right, Lance? I mean, if you, it's far out of our scope as brokers. We need to stay in our lane um, once it gets to a certain size to say, hey, you should be bringing in a professional to do these audits and that things Absolutely. of that nature. Because even, okay. even, in lease, even in a lease where there's no obvious... Um, negotiated terms that are in the tenant's favor in the OPEC section. <clears throat> the landlord still has so many decisions to make on how it charges its operating costs um, and how it allocates costs uh, amongst different use tenants in the building, different categories that may be an office building that's got a, a retail concourse tied to a residential condo next door or shopping center. Uh, there may be, um, uh, you know, there's just so many decisions the landlord has to make. Uh, that it, it can it can make mistakes in its own favor, if you want to phrase it that way. Um, so you really need do need to have an expert look at your operating costs, particularly if you're a larger occupier. So our floor, our, our base on accepting uh, any sort of audit work is an office tenant that has at least 30,000 square feet. Um, and the rule of thumb is we want to see you having uh, ideally 10% or more of your building's DLA. 
So if you're 30,000 square feet, square feet in a 2 million square foot building, um, that's not, a, that's not an ideal audit candidate for us. But if you're a 30,000 square feet in a 300,000 square foot building, uh, now it's starting to look more attractive. And that's just a simple matter of uh, having more leverage with the landlord and then wanting to spend the time uh, to allow us to come in and, and do your audit. Um, okay. Every, every, in almost every case, um, I found that there's adjustments that are required. Sometimes they're just, you know, smaller petty and we just recommend to our client to pass on. Sometimes they're more material. And, and, and in the larger office uh, audits that we do, we end up with a bucket of, three buckets of operating cost discrepancies. One that's going to be a black and white set of issues that they're just deal breakers. The landlord, the lease says they're doing X and the landlord is doing Y. Those have to be rectified. And then you've got a, a whole bucket of gray area items. And unfortunately, even the best intended lease language can have a lot of contradictions and unclear direction on how to treat certain items. So you end up having a gray bucket of items that needs to get negotiated out. Typically a good negotiating, a, a, new, a good settlement on a gray bucket would be anywhere between 50 to 70% in the tenant's favor, which should be considered a success if you can't agree with the landlord. And then you've got a bucket of nuisance items. The nuisance items we use as leverage in negotiating for the gray and the black and white items in, in, in the final settlement discussions with the landlord. So the nuisance items we may not choose to go through. And sometimes we'll say to the landlord, look, we're not even going to um, bring our tenant, uh, bring, bring our client, uh, your tenant through the long list of things that you really shouldn't have been charging for. Uh, taxis to drinking sessions as your management group, um, flying executives across the country, donating, donating to different organizations of charitable donations are excluded, um, industry associations, lots of uh, reimbursements of expenses, uh, tenant gifts, things like that, that may be immaterial at the tenant's pro share, but they're aggravating because they shouldn't be recovered. And so you end up with those three buckets uh, of items. Um, there's, there's so, there, we could talk for hours on each of um, the major components of additional rent. So how to do a gross up properly, what items should be grossed up, um, what capital, how to treat capital expenditure. I saw that was a question that came up in the Q&A, what is defined as a CapEx? And there's no right or, there's no hard, fast definition of CapEx that I've ever seen in a lease, but the better leases sort of speak to a dollar amount that, that, that of an item that, that bring it into the CapEx category. So a $50,000 um, replacement of a, of a component of, a, of an item in a million square foot building is unlikely to be capital. Um, a, a $1 million item in a two, a two million square foot building or a million square foot building would, using the test litmus test of materiality, would likely be treated as a capital item. Um, and then there's a whole segue into what capital items should we allow the landlord, not allow the landlord, um, one of the common things that landlords like to do is a washroom renovation. So they'll update and modernize all the washrooms. They'll put the shiny new fixtures in, the granite countertops, the you know the beautiful LED lighting. And after they spend millions of dollars doing all that, they'll also, of course, put new toilets in and new water, you know, low flow water uh, valves. Well, the cost of the low flow water valves and the energy, you know, water you know, saving toilets may only be 10% of the cost of the entire washroom modernization project. So if the lease says CapEx are excluded except for those items that uh, provide energy efficiencies or cost savings, well, the landlords will charge through typically the cost of the washroom modernization. But maybe they should only be recovering 10% and 90% of it should be disallowed along with the interest on the amortized portion, which is also just as material. Um, so the CapEx is a whole discussion in and of itself. Um, you know, um, allocation amongst the different components of the property is also a big topic. So where you have, let's say 200,000 square foot of retail concourse underneath a million and a half square foot office building, um, what, do you, what buckets of, of CAM do you have? And what costs get shared between the two buckets and what costs are specific for retail? Um, major uh, uh, um, uh, argument we had with the landlord was, in an office building that had this 200,000 foot of shopping concourse beneath it, um, the security costs were just enormous for the property um, that were mostly for patrolling the retail. And so the lease actually required the landlord to differentiate between the retail and office uh, components and allocate the costs to each accordingly. 
Well, as we all know, in an office building, even if you have 24 seven coverage, you just have a person at the front desk typically, they don't go through the tenant suites. They might go to the floor, but they're not going in the suites. So you don't need more than one person, two at the very most in a larger building. But you could have 10 security guards roaming the concourse at, at any given point in time. That's an enormous cost that should only be paid for by the retail tenants. So that's, that's one example. Um, of, 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 of things that come up when you have a mixed use building. Another, another landlord said, well, you know, we're just going to put it all into one bucket and, and, and spread it even. Well, that doesn't work either. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, especially in larger markets like Los Angeles and New York and Chicago, where they have those big mixed use projects. We're starting to get them here in Vegas. Um, but yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and why these conversations are so important. And SIORs call them baby brokers uh, that don't think about these. And it's just something that's not taught. You know, we kind of broker just hire brokers and sit them at a desk or get a junior to hire, to, you know, to teach a junior. And that's why this is so important. So again, I just appreciate your time and the way that, you know, your all of your years of experience um, really can help and in turn help our industry as a whole, because, you know, you guys getting those phone calls of, oh my God, I got a eight years of reconciliation as soon as I turned in my, you know, I'm, I'm leaving to my, my landlord. It just makes us all look bad. We've all received those calls where our clients are underserved. Um, and it's just, it does a disservice to our industry or the people that dabble in both, you know, we call them resi Marshall, um, which and I get in trouble all the time for my mouth, but, um, you know, it just does us all a disservice. So uh, great point, Lance. Thank you so much. And again, we're going to do a follow-up where we can do a real deep dive. Absolutely. If you want to see my blood boil, show me almost every lease where they have the language regarding after our day track and how much the tenants should pay for the after our day track um, and, and, and the rates. Um, and uh, particularly on the West Coast through San Francisco uh, and, and in Los Angeles, um, landlords are out of, out of body control. Um, well, Lance, with that, I usually put some kind of formula in there uh, tied to depreciation and the actual cost of the furnishing of the after hours by the landlord so they don't use it as a profit center. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole slew of problems. Are they charging for utilities? Are they charging for labor? Uh, is it labor just to program the building automation system, or is it more than that? This, it's a whole topic that I, you know, I probably shouldn't even start to get in. I kind of want you to, because I'm working on something right now with that. Oh, yeah. so, but uh, <laughs> we're going to have a follow-up. We'll have a little follow-up. Maybe I'll just have a whole webinar on it, and I'll just sit there and take There's notes. There's a whole slew of issues on how they, how they, what components are, are allowed to be included in those after-hours dollar amounts that are set. How is the landlord treating when it, when it recovers it? What is it doing with those monies? Is it putting it into sundry income, and or, or where is it allocating it? So that, that's a whole. We can have a whole, you know, half day or day. Do or something so. on that because the purposes of this, I don't think you know. I, well, I see some senior level like Stacy Shapiro's huge in Vegas and a CCIM and over at Collier. So I love that she's here um, and asked that great question. But yeah, so that's a deeper dive. We'll definitely have a follow up, Lance. Um, and I, I have, have questions. Definitely, <laughs> absolutely. Topic on uh, you know concept of parking garage expenses, less so in the suburban areas, of course, but where you have a paid parking garage, and typically this is where the garage is beneath the building, uh, or you know, or, or above building, but it's the first you know how many levels of the of the of the tower, so to speak, in a, in a downtown core, where you have significant paid parking coming in. A lot of the good tenant leases, uh, tenant friendly leases, will have language that specifically exclude parking expenses. But landlords will typically do a very good job of excluding the direct expenses incurred for the garage, like if they're line painting or the power washing, you'll see those excluded. But very rarely do they go a step further and say, well, you know, the part, the shuttle elevator is part of my base building elevator contract, you know, I'm not going to bother allocating it for that. And, you know, the, all the lighting in the garage and the, and the power consumed by the HVAC system that that's circulating the air through the garage or heat in the garage in the cold refinery. I'm not going to bother to allocate those costs. Um, and the cleaning costs, if the vestibule is in the garage, depending on how many levels there are, could be significant. I'm not going to look at that either. So there's there's a whole and insurance as a big one because the liability coverage in the garage is where most of the insurance dollars are, not the property coverage because it's just funky. Um, uh, never mind uh, the capex that could be part of the garage. Um, and, and often there's a differentiation between taxes to the garage and, and operating expenses in the garage. Um, the, the taxes would generally not be excluded, but the operating expenses will be excluded. 
so the, the, again, it's a whole, we could have, we could have a few hour discussion on, on what should be excluded and how would you start to figure out and make those calculations uh, and, and then engage the landlord in, in figuring this out. Um, the benefit of having a third party do a lease audit is that you as the tenant don't have to have these difficult discussions directly with the landlord, even if you had the expertise. And I would suggest to you that, that I haven't seen a sophisticated tenant yet that had the internal expertise to do this. Um, I have a number of law firm clients that have very intelligent lawyers um, in their real estate group, but they don't have the lease audit experience because to be a lease auditor, you have to have um, an understanding of the cost, but you also have to have enough experience in gray hair to know how to get information from the landlord and, and negotiate the outcome um, uh, suitable to, to, to all parties. And so the landlord doesn't feel unfairly treated and neither does the tenant. Okay. It all comes to be a good lease, which is a segue back to, you know, Henny, to, to the, the rest of you on this discussion is that the time you invest in having a good lease uh, is just so important. And I always tell my clients, well, some of my clients, yeah. and, and as a non-broker, I can tell you this, some of my clients say, well, we're just going to renew the lease ourselves. It's simple. Well, I don't, I'm not going to involve a broker. I, my, my, my blood starts to boil. Um, I'm never going to be a broker. I, my passion is only saw that I'm an accountant. Um, but I always recommend to my clients to hire a broker. They're not paying for it. The landlord's paying for it. And guess what? You're not getting a better deal because you didn't hire a broker. So hire a broker, get a lawyer involved, have someone like me look at the cost if it's a large enough premises and get all your, get all the experts lined up to help you get the right document signed. So you're not paying the price down the road. Well, yeah, I think we all like that message for sure. Yeah, you need a broker, a hundred percent. A little bit uh, later, you pay a lot later. Well, it's true. Like you said, pay now or pay later. So I appreciate that. And I'm glad you mentioned parking. So that brings us, I can't believe we're on number six of the lease. Um, and that's what it's like to review a lease, brokers. So make sure you really want to get into this industry. But again, that gets you closer to that that commission, um, which is nice, right? So with parking facilities, um, you've already negotiated this in the proposal process. How many parking spaces, how many are covered reserved? And if you're uh, good at your job, you hopefully got some of those covered reserved at an abatement uh, for either the whole lease term or part of the lease term. And so what here are we looking for, if anything? That your rights uh, extend into any extension options. So if you extend your lease, that you still maintain these rights and that you also have the right to add more spaces. Okay, and that's not here. So we would just add language for the length of the term and any extension um, options thereafter uh, should be inserted there. Just, you know, super easy. Just add that as a line item. Um, and then you also have the right to um, negotiate for more ongoing. Is that how you'd write that, Claire? Yeah, basically. And I think Kim said it earlier, is you, you're signing a five-year term, your lease, your tenant is, you have to think about beyond today and you have to think about the client's needs in the future. So make sure you're covering the future for them. That's yes. And then if you're luckily you get that, hopefully you get that phone call that they want to expand. And when you do, you need to make sure that you're also asking for more parking spaces um, at that time as well. Natalie, can I make a real basic comment here? Okay. I did a, I did a deal with a tenant that um, had two floors in a building, office building in downtown St. Paul. And they literally had been in that building like 62 years, um, financial services firm. And they have clients coming to the building all the time and typically more in you know the February, March, April months of the year. They never had any parking allocation for their clients. No free parking for clients was ever negotiated into their lease. That was one of the first things I negotiated for them was a parking allowance for their clients coming to the building. And of course the landlord wanted it to be something like $2,000 per month. And if they didn't use it, again, it's give that landlord pushback. If, if their clients are coming to their building three months of a year, it's a cumulative amount, $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year, and they can use it at any time, not just in that month because they would have wasted a lot of money right. not using that those those parking allowance in you know the, the off months so you know look at those details and make sure you're covering your clients and their needs and what they do 
Absolutely. And if you're doing a doctor's office or if you're doing yep. something where it's retail based at a like where it's just you park right, pull right up, ask for your client to get one exclusive space right out front of their right out front of their storefront, um, so to speak. Ask for it. Think of the things that your client's not thinking of. It's our job. We do it all day. They do it once every five years. So be thinking of it and make sure it makes its way to the lease um, and isn't just a conversation while you're touring. Um, okay, utilities, anything here that we want to make sure we cover um, in the lease portion? If you're in a, in a building, an office building, this look, this lease is what I think is, a, um, you know, it's only an 8,000 square foot property. Each tenant's got one fifth of the property and it's everyone's paying their own bills directly to the city. Um, and go pretty one common area building like it's shared, shared amongst the tenants uh, as part of the base expenses. Um, but utility charges in an office building can be quite complicated. And you really need to understand as a tenant what type of user you are and the type of building you're going into. Um, so if you're a, a, a real heavy dense user going into a building that does not have a metering system, you're probably going to score because the other tenants are going to, are going to end up subsidizing your high density use. Um, if you are, uh, if you're a tenant that comes in and you're a services firm that has data, uh, data rooms, a number of data rooms, you may need to have supplemental equipment. So I would prefer to have those um, additional utilities metered if possible, if not your entire floor metered uh, and every other floor in the building metered so that you end up at a point where Every tenant or each tenant sharing a floor is sharing the meter cost of that floor only. That makes it life a lot simpler when we get to the gross up language, because then um, every tenant is being billed back for their electricity. The only electricity left in common area is base building, which really doesn't fluctuate much, if at all, with occupancy level. So you end up having a very easy or much easier time I explained to the landlord why they shouldn't have gross up utilities when every tenant has been allocated their in suite premises to utility, utility consumption. Okay. And that, I think that too is something where it's a real deep dive, uh, especially for your larger clients that rely a lot um, and tax those services. You're going to want to really beef that up. Now, the maintenance is something as well that you want to pay attention to, uh, especially here in Vegas when it comes to the HVAC. So this is also something that we'll cover in a future one. I don't wanna to do too much of a deep on this, especially with us running out of time. Um, it's 11.25, we're gonna be ending here in less than five minutes. So we're not gonna be able to cover, uh, you know, we'll probably do a part two on this because there's so much more. And I know that I'm so thankful to the people that are still here to have over 50 people still watching. I know that you wanted to get more out of this. So I, you know, my day job is a broker. I'm obviously not very good at this. I'll get better as we go. And this series is going to cover everything that it takes to be a broker because the feedback has been so phenomenal um, on this series. So um, thank you again to the panelists. I actually just think we'll wrap it up here and we'll do a part two because um, you know, and I, I, I apologize guys for me to try to get the release and now it was adorable. Um, so, for lack of a better phrase. Um, so thank you to everybody that's in the room. We'll do a part two. You'll get the invitation automatically if you registered for part one. Um, and I apologize again. And this, I'll send you the recording as well if you already registered so that you can rewatch it. I know that I'll be rewatching it. Um, any closing comments panelists that you wanna share to, and keep it, let's, let's, do, let's point our closing comments for the broker, the people in the room that either want to get into the business or are new. And I can think of two people in the room right now that are new to the business and excited and, you know, they're ready. They just got their license. What is your advice to them when it comes to, you know, the lease review process? My advice would be not necessarily to know the entire lease, obviously, um, but to know, say, say seven to 10 key negotiating points, particularly items that would hurt their pocketbook, i.e. operating expenses that uh, could distinguish you between the typical broker who doesn't do this stuff. And if you just have a couple minutes to shine on the phone or in person, if you're out actually canvassing uh, physically in the tenants um, and you got maybe 60 seconds, 90 seconds with them, if you could shine with say seven to 10 key points that their brokers never even brought up, you're, you're, gonna, be, uh, you're gonna be very formidable. You know, I will uh, tag on to that. And Jeff, I totally agree with everything you're saying. 
I think when you're a new broker, don't assume that a lease that is shorter is going to be better. In most cases, it's typically worse because there are so many holes in it. And your job as a broker, even though you're not negotiating the legal terms, you really are there to advocate for your client. And you want to make sure that that lease is a document that they can live with, you know, for whatever the term is, three or five years, seven, 10. And if you have not, if it's, if there's so many holes in it, it's not going to be good for them. So um, don't think that a short lease is a good thing. Um, long leases can be really bad too, but you know, Lance talked about all the expense clauses and Jeff made the comment about the half a million dollars in expenses that got tacked on after 10 years. You know, make sure the lease is right for your client. So don't make assumptions, but do your due diligence. Claire, I've got to ask you, when you say short, are you referring to the term of the lease? Or no, I'm referring to, referring to like a five-page document or like you said, from a resume so that gives you that boilerplate three-page lease that makes no sense. It's, oh it's absolutely hideous and it's going to cost your client money in the end. And your job is to give pushback and say, okay, we need a commercial lease. Yeah. Understand, we like your, you like your form documents, but we need a commercial lease. You need to hire an attorney to get a lease done and yep. give us yeah, a, a commercial I'll go, document. I'll go a little bit different, um, a totally different direction. You're not going to learn this in this session. You're not going to learn this overnight. This is, I mean, I think all of us, none of us are 30, right? <laughs> um, and, and so it takes time. So I think really what you should do is ask for help. Um, rely on a senior mentor, a more experienced mentor to help you and sit there and soak it up like a sponge. That's how we all learn. We learn by listening to somebody that knew what they were doing. Sit on those calls with counsel. Don't sit there and, and play on your phone the entire time. Sit there and actually absorb and learn and then ask questions um, because you're, you, you're not going to be an expert immediately and don't pretend to be an expert. So learn as much as you can along the way, um, take the sections that you do understand, and then ask Jeff for help, ask Claire for help, ask myself for help, ask somebody in your own company that is going to be a mentor or your broker of record to assist you. Okay, not to know everything, but you need to know when you don't know something. That's correct. 100%. You need to just identify that there might be an issue somewhere and seek help. And know that no matter how many gray hairs you have and how many years under your belt, hey. there are always going to be new clauses that, that are thrown in there. Um, I had one this year. I won't go into details, maybe in part two, but it was like, what? And my client read it. I read it. The attorney read it. We all saw it one way. And then it got explained to us why the landlord was asking for this. And it was like, oh, yeah, now that makes sense. So there's always going to be things you learn, you know, no matter how many years you do this. How about you, Jeff? Well, like I said, I I, I uh, I'd recommend that they, they know, say, seven to ten key points of a lease that... Uh, uh, oh, that's what I, you said. I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my <laughs> idea would really hit the, 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 the tenant, the prospect. I mean... Uh, yeah, no, I know. That's why you've that. done some of the biggest deals in your market is really honing in on one thing and just, I mean, you just knock everybody out of the park that you're, you know, trying to go up against. So I love I think, I'd say 90% of my business, like I said before, uh, comes from actually getting in front of the prospect to review the lease. And uh, uh, so all of whom have a quote unquote, I have a current broker. And uh, yet if I'm able to go in there and, and separate myself from he or she, his, his current broker, by, by having some fundamental knowledge of lease contract law, I mean, I'm more than likely going to get the deal. I don't think I've ever done a lease of maybe once out of uh, a couple thousand lease analysis. If I ever not got the deal, if it went, once I've had an opportunity to sit and do the work. Yeah. Yeah. What a great way to earn business. Right. right. You know, that's another one of the these that we've done is a way to, you know, prospect and earn business, which is a huge part of being a broker, right? Is to prospect and to be able to use your your smarts and 
help the client to do it, it's a twofer. So um, thank you so much to the panelists. I, and I agree with you, Kim, it's not, you're not gonna learn it on this, but to be able to get that feedback and hear the way that these people are thinking um, is such a value. And so your guys' wisdom and the fact that you're willing to share it is just a kudos to the way that this industry is moving. It's less about hiding your paper. And so I just, I thank you so much for your time, uh, panelists. And I'm Natalie Wayne. I didn't even introduce myself. Uh, Natalie Wainwright uh, here in Las Vegas with Logic Commercial. And thank you so much. I can't believe there's still 50 people here. You're all amazing. Uh, reach out to everybody and we'll see you next time for part two. Thank you guys. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Natalie. Bye.